Um, hi, everybody. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, um, I'm Tanya. I'm not a designer. I'm not a coder. I'm not a statistician. Uh, in my day job, I teach literature and writing at a local university, and I love horror film. Uh, every so often, I get to sneak it into a class, which I can only hope is as fun for my students as it is for me. So tonight, I'm going to share my capstone project with you, which looks at horror film around the world that's thematically organized around the act of making, um, and perhaps given the genre, unmaking. So what got me interested in this? Well, I grew up a tomboy surrounded by brothers, stepbrothers, and brothers' friends. I stole my mother's library copy of Stephen King's Christine when I was about 12, and I was introduced to Monty Python and the Holy Grail a few years later. The title for this project is drawn from King's writing memoir, where he exhorts young writers to be willing to destroy their creations if they don't serve the purpose. Uh, and shout out to Dan, who may or may not be in this room for this fantastic suggestion, so thank you. <laughs> For Monty Python, my favorite scenes were those with the Black Knight and the Killer Bunny. Why? They were super gory to my young eyes and also just so absolutely fake, kind of like, you know, when a boom mic drops down from the corner of a movie you're watching. Uh, and this just led to a lifelong fascination with horror, especially self-conscious and campy horror. I think my favorite film, uh, maybe of all time, is Peter Jackson's 1992 Dead Alive, which if you have seen it, will give you a really good sense of where I'm coming from. So as I grew up, I read scholars like Carol Clover, Noel Carroll, Robin Woods, Tom Gunning, Linda Williams, and Laura Mulvey. Uh, Clover is probably most well known uh, for coining the concept of the final girl. But she makes the point later in her book, Men, Women, and Chainsaws, that there's a prima facie case to be made that horror is the most self-aware of genres focusing, as it does, on the act of watching and the limits of what we can watch. So I really wanted to test this theory with data. So a bit about my process, which was arduous to say the least. I went on so many tangents and had so many different ideas that it was just really hard to narrow things down. I zeroed in finally on IMDB data, which is crowdsourced. Um, and I really wanted to do a network analysis. So that was another reason why I chose this data. I used Python to scrape additional textual data like summaries and synopses from, um, from the website. I calculated and recalculated things. I'm not sure that it's even calculated correctly now. <laughs> Um, and I tinkered in Tableau, I sketched, I drafted, I threw ideas away. At one point, I had a devastating realization that human error, my own human error about my own human error, and it sort of sent me back to the drawing board. I actually started two totally different projects, one on higher ed and uh, one on my favorite Jane Austen novel, Persuasion. So I did ultimately, though, return to my original topic, uh, much subdued by the data, and I ended up with three print visualizations meant for display in a local art house cinema. Um, and if you recognize this image, it's from uh, Landmarks East Street Cinemas in DC. So, uh, so I, I created these three visualizations and uh, also an interactive network analysis that fans can really dig deeper with. Uh, it's important to note that I did choose this site, uh, Landmark East Street Cinemas, for the project in part because of the nature of the space, uh, and I wanted to adapt my visualizations to conform to that space. So here, as you can see, theater goers uh, walk past the vises on their right as they proceed toward the popcorn and drinks, the ticket taker, and eventually the theaters themselves. Uh, this means that the timelines have all been reversed. So they start at 1900 and they go to 2022. Uh, the first two visualizations are sized as well for display in a typical um, movie poster fashion. They are 27 by 40 inches, making them fit easily into existing frames. Uh, my audience is both fans of the genre who often compete with each other to find the most obscure, the campiest, the grossest films they can find. Uh, but it's also film scholars who may be, unlike Clover, skeptical. So how could I speak to both of these audiences? Well, first, by citing the visualizations physically in a place that, that both of these audiences frequent, um, and also by thinking through design and content. 
So I drew my palette inspiration from 17th century Dutch still lives, uh, though it was ultimately abstracted from the final project. Um, pretty, pretty distantly abstracted. Uh, but from that palette, I used and adapted a refined red and black color scheme that I hope resonates with both audiences. Uh, like the color choices, a sort of pale yellow cream, a dusty blood color, and a not quite black black, uh, my typefaces, belly, and TT norms suggest something off-putting. So in addition to design choices that speak indirectly to both audiences, I was very interested in illuminating the history of this brand of horror, uh, as that's something that film scholars really prize, um, uh, sort of locating a tradition that helps make sense of individual texts. Uh, so the first and third visualizations use timelines in the form of stacked stream graphs, which have a fluidity that echoes um, some blood spell adders throughout. So this is an excerpt from the first visualization, sorry, um, that sort of looks at uh, proportions of horror films about art to not horror films about art, both by decade and individual year. Uh, the, 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 um, the sort of less uh, defined stream graphs are for decades and the more varied ones are years. The darker red is horror films about art and the lighter is um, not horror films about art. So, uh, sorry. Uh, this same visualization also has a component down at the bottom that takes a little bit more focused look at each individual topic, which I'll talk about later, uh, and how many films were produced each year on that topic. The third visualization features an invitation to the audience both to contribute to IMDb and explore the network analysis online. Uh, it foregrounds the timeline with specifically chosen film callouts. Um, each stream graph uh, points to a specific topic um, that I, I was interested in terms of the larger theme of making and creativity. Uh, I also created a network analysis in Gephi, and this is in particular geared toward fans. Uh, it's meant to help them discover new films, and it's also super fun to play with. I created a, a little bit of a video here um, so that you can just sort of see how it works, but uh, the URL is available on the screen. So you can search for individual films and you can uh, connect to different films through the connections in the network uh, and, um, and so on. So data collection and analysis. Um, my primary data set was a 300,000 plus data set of scraped IMDB records uh, that contained the unique identifier for each film and the summary and the synopsis and the country of origin array for each feature length film in um, one of eight genres. Uh, I looked at, of course, at, at horror, but also drama, action, sci-fi, romance, mystery, and thriller. And this was in part because I wanted initially to think about genre um, and how it intersected with horror films. So I then joined this data set with the material that IMDB makes available daily. Uh, this gave me additional fields to work with, like genre, um, which is also an array of up to three associated genres, uh, year, primary and original titles, and ratings data. So to test Clover's on the face of it observation, it occurred to me that I could look at films that took as their subject the act of creating, which is what I did. I came to my themes by way of domain knowledge, a bit of user testing, and searching for textual patterns in, um, in Tableau prep. So the keyword data that I was looking for um, works with 10 topic groups that I created, uh, each of which includes a set of keywords that I searched for in the data script from IMDb. And then uh, I counted each reference to a keyword in the group and associated that number with the film. Uh, so you can see here, my um, topic groups are things like art, which, um, which incorporates keywords like art, artist, artists, artista, artist, the, artes. And these are um, sort of remnants of the tokenizing process, why these words aren't you know, um, clear. Uh, writing, create, museum, which is a little bit broader, but it includes things like art gallery, curator, curators, exhibits, exhibition, museum, uh, and so on. 
painting, photography, sculpture or the plastic arts, uh, dance, recording, and uh, recording or filmmaking, and, and theater. Uh, my data set significantly includes only films with two or more references to a keyword in that topic group, and that helped me to weed out false positives. Uh, the network diagram contains the summaries for each film, but it doesn't show the synopses, which can be quite lengthy in nature, several pages long. Um, so some hits may come from that, but it's not visible in the network analysis. Uh, additionally, it's important to note that many of the films uh, don't include summaries or synopses. Uh, and so I also searched in the titles. So this is what my data kind of looks like. Um, I had to do a lot of pivoting and joining. And I also experimented with um, some other data that I wanted, I was considering bringing in like uh, in gross domestic product data, um, population data and, and size of film industry data. Um, but ultimately I didn't end up using a lot of that um, though I do have it for a future iteration of this prototype. I did end up using uh, a calculation that is meant to um, suggest film industry size for each country, which I'll show you later. So one oddity of the IMDB data is that um, uh, a film might be in two or three different genres and it might be associated with none or up to six countries. Uh, so overall, I decided to use proportions to get at the questions I had uh, using key calculations that showed the ratio of horror films to all films, horror films about art to all horror films, and then films that are not horror um, to, uh, but still about art to all films that are not horror. And so by horror and not horror, I mean uh, records with and without the string horror in the genre array. Uh, I also looked at the proportions of horror about specific art subjects to all art horror by year and decade, uh, and then the same for not horror. And that really became the central information I visualized in those 2D pieces. Some difficulties I had in the data collection and shaping process included identifying the keywords and topic clusters from the outset, uh, and then learning new things as I went. <laughs> I also did some testing with some knowledgeable film fans that I know, and that helps me immensely. I did have to retokenize the data um, uh, at least twice during this process, and uh, that took quite a bit of time. And uh, of course, all of this is dependent on user contributions to IMDb, which has its own problems that I do want to mention. Uh, I also found myself working across multiple platforms, um, which given that I'm not uh, neither a designer nor a coder <laughs> nor a statistician was, was really hard. Um, I found myself working between Python, R, Tableau, Tableau Prep, Illustrator, and a bunch of other platforms. So keeping track of everything was just really, really challenging. Um, this is a picture of my file structure, which I kind of secretly hope that this is what everyone's looks like. Um, let me know in Slack if that's the case afterwards. <laughs> so some key findings are worth pointing out. Um, first, horror films are in fact more likely to be about art than non-horror films. Uh, it's actually about 60-40 overall, which is visible both by decade and year. So in this layered stream graph, and I apologize for the quality of the image, um, but, uh, but the, the full images are, are more visible. Um, so in this layered stream graph, the decade data is in the background and the early, the yearly data is in the foreground. And the dark red shows the proportion of horror films about art to all horror films produced by decade and by year. And the lighter color, uh, the same thing with non-horror films. And this is interesting because it shows how genre impacts the subject. Uh, 1953, as you can see here, was a notable high point. 55% of all horror films made that year focused on making. Um, and this, I think, sets the stage for the golden age of horror, at least in the US, um, which, you know, happens in the 60s and 70s, uh, particularly the 70s. Uh, but, you know, the, the, one of the things that we may want to think about is the fact that the US is really the largest film producer by far. Um, they made over, we, we made over 3 million films from um, the inception of, of feature length films to today. And the second highest is the United Kingdom, and they actually had not quite 900,000. So something interesting to keep in mind. Uh, and then second, one of the other things that's interesting is that after the 1980s, uh, the disparity between horror films about making and not horror films about making kind of equalizes. Um, so this is sort of interesting to me. Uh, I think maybe it might be because of the uptick in film production that occurred in the 90s and 2000s. Um, Three, 
the decades in which key themes that I'm looking at were produced is, is also really interesting. So the 1950s, um, which is uh, along this decade, this line here, right, 1950, 1940, 1930, and so on. Uh, the 1950s see higher proportions of films about creating and films about dance, which is sort of unsurprising given the broader film trends of the period, so science fiction and musicals. Right? <laughs> uh, sculpture and the plastic arts are the highest by proportion in the 1910s, which sort of makes sense because this is the beginning of the film uh, of, of cinema. Uh, and horror film in the 1980s was much more likely to privilege photography and acting. So this chart um, shows those key themes I'm looking at, one on each line, and then each line shows the proportion of horror films created in that year that feature that theme. So for instance, 23% of all the films made in the 1910s are about the plastic arts. Uh, before the studio system emerged more fully in the 1940s, we're, you know, we're, we're really talking about pretty low numbers overall. Uh, fourth, almost all countries with a film industry, however small, have horror films. And often a surprisingly large percentage of their films are, are horror, um, like Andorra. Who would have thought right, <laughs> that over 25% of all of their films are horror films? Um, and the smallest of film industries have horror films also about art and making, uh, like Myanmar, Iceland, and Slovenia. Uh, some countries with higher uh, horror film production, like Thailand and Cambodia, have actually very few films about art. Um, I would have expected Thailand to have many horror films about making, but proportionally it actually has very few. Uh, and uh, this second viz, uh, this, this, these images come from the second viz, Horrors World Cinema, uh, works really well, I think, in tandem with the network diagram. So in five, the sort of last um, finding that I think is worth mentioning is that the summaries and synopses provided by IMDb are notably gendered and not in a good way. And this comes from the crowdsourcing. Uh, a future version of this prototype might explore this in more detail, but for now, um, note that I've edited the storylines that are included in the third visualization, just to be less dismissive of women's experience. Um, we know that uh, Wikipedia editors are overwhelmingly white, male, and middle-aged. Um, this is likely the case with IMDb as well, even though uh, more explanation and exploration is, is needed. So the future. My ultimate goal is to write a book on the subject of a horror about making uh, across the world, and this prototype has really helped me uh, on that path. There are several other avenues for analysis that uh, I hope to follow in the future, including looking at shorts, which often allow creators to experiment more freely uh, because of the fewer time and resource restrictions. I'd also like to explore the distribution of genres over time and definitely employ some natural language processing on the textual data, uh, maybe doing some gender analysis that way. But perhaps most importantly, this project has led me to ask questions about the way that the act of creating is treated in these films. Uh, so I've already begun developing a data set that identifies a rubric by which to describe horror about making, like what is the role of the artist, what's the sex of the artist, what key tropes um, are repeated most frequently, like blood as paint, bodies enclosed in clay, and, and so on. So I think I can with some degree of surety say that yes, the data does show horror to be a more self-aware genre. Um, and this project really allowed me to extend Carol's observation to its logical conclusion. Horror is not just about eyes watching horror, it's also in some meaningful way about the act of making, creating aesthetic objects or experiences, uh, often through the rubric of unmaking or destruction. So thank you all for giving me this time. Um, I really appreciate it. I want to extend special thanks to my cohort and my teachers. Uh, our special guest tonight, my partner Steve, um, and his brother Shafiq. Shafiq for his just extraordinarily, extraordinary patience with me as I learned how to scrape and tokenize things. Uh, and Steve, my partner for just keeping me fed, for rubbing my neck when I had been at the computer for hours on end, and for not leaving me as a result. <laughs> so um, that's all. Uh, thank you very much, and I look forward to questions.